All right. Um, I don't know if any of you are familiar with the uh, uh, Loa Library, uh, but they're going through a lot of changes there. And uh, we're going to have someone from uh, Eric Squire, who's an enthusiastic spokesperson for the Aloha uh, Library. He's going to tell us what's going on there. So let's give a warm on us. Welcome to Eric Squire. How you do, Eric Squire? How you do? How you do, Eric Squire? How you do? How you do? We welcome you today. We are with you all the way. How do you do, Eric Squire? How you do, do, do? <laughs> What an enthusiastic reception, thank you. And thank you to Jeff uh, for the invitation to be here. Uh, so you know my name, but my story starts with you. In 1984, one of the most formidable experiences I ever had in my life was being a camp counselor at the Mount Hood Kiwanis Camp. And thank that applause is what you as a club deserve because you impacted my life and it's a real privilege to pay that forward. It, those formidable um, impacts that you made in the lives of youth, well, I want to remind you that those are coming to its fruition now. And if I could weave that into how the Aloha Library got started, the ability to work in small groups and deal with people of varying ability sets was one of the things that I garnered as being a camp counselor. And it helped me with something I still have pride into this very day, and that was to graduate high school with college credit. The partnership the Kiwanis Camp had with Portland State University allowed the, uh, uh, the students who volunteered as camp counselors to earn college credit. So in between my junior and senior year of high school, I was able to start collecting college credit, which allowed me to leverage my life a little bit faster and compete on a, a more competitive track than I would otherwise. So once again, I'm just so grateful for that opportunity. Through that, it instilled a sense of service work that was fortified by my family. Before the Kiwanis camp, I was a Cub Scout. And Mom thought that being a Cub Scout and go, doing litter pickups on the side of the road and fundraising, doing cans and bottle drives were things that people should be focused on and should be doing. So those experiences led to uh, something that's going to sound a little non sequitur. For eight election cycles, for eight years, I volunteered to do a program that's sponsored by Washington County. As the Cedar Mill Club likely knows, Cedar Mill is not a city, neither is Aloha. So we have to be a little scrappy and do things ourselves because we don't have a mayor or city council to blame things. And we've got some very part-time county commissioners that do wonderful work, but they are not a city. So hopefully I won't get too political, but I could see from a few of the smirks and laughters there, you know what I'm talking about. We understand. Okay, wonderful, thank you. I don't mean to offend, but I do need to be honest. Um, so. Through the citizen participation organization, that's mandated uh, that the county or cities have a citizen involvement program for land use. And the county got some federal money to come out and tell us how it was going to be. And as a volunteer, I listened to this and I just thought to myself, oh my gosh, we need another option. Before this meeting for the Aloha Reedville study, which was going to fix and study all the problems of Aloha and Reedville, an unincorporated community <laughs> a lot like Cedar Mill, um, this guy from the, the, the Oregonian picked up the phone and called me. His name was Bill Orem. This reporter said, Beaverton's opening up a second library. If Beaverton has two libraries, why does Aloha have none? I didn't have an answer, but I said, Mr. Orem, I'll take that back to my CPO group. And CPO is shorthand for Citizen Participation Organization. I kind of honestly call it crackpots perturbed often because it's often where uh, the county likes to put up set citizens to talk amongst themselves. And most of the time, they talk themselves out of energy. A few times, they get organized. And that's what I leveraged with the Aloha Library. So after listening to this presentation, I said, Aloha needs a focal point. It needs a central pivot. It needs um, a lightning rod to control and contain um, the aspirations of what this community wants to be. So we formed a working group, and we started meeting at the Pepper Mill Restaurant, which is at the intersection of uh, uh, Kinnaman and Farmington. 
I want to make sure everybody can hear me. Do I need to grab the mic, or is everybody okay with my volume? You, okay, one. Use the mic. Okay, I, I will. Excellent. So, am I on? Now I'm on. Okay, fantastic. So, it was kind of a running joke that a lot of these ideas just fall apart after a few meetings. Yet, from that first coffee clatch, that first meeting, we had some A-game talent that just came together. We formed a, a nucleus working group, and then 22 months later, we opened the doors to a library. Now, there's another Cedar Mill connection I'm just beaming with pride about. If you go to the Cedar Mill Public Library, which is the largest private library well, it's not exactly private. It's, it's, a, it's a, a public library, but it's a private corporation. So it's a, it's a nonprofit. But it's the largest one this side of the Mississippi. The Bales family, specifically Otis Bales, saw the leadership that was needed in the community and donated so much of the real estate uh, that was needed to grow that library. And we were shocked because we started learning about libraries. And if I dare go a little political on you, Mr. Andrew Carnegie, which I guess is the correct pronunciation, not Carnegie, but Carnegie, well, he harvested a lot of the, uh, the equity of America and did so upsetting so many people that he had to figure out how he was going to survive and not be assassinated. <laughs> how he did that was by giving back tremendous amounts of wealth to the communities that he harvested in the form of public libraries, because public libraries are so beloved. So we come knocking on the doorsteps of uh, the Bales Finley Limited Liability Corporation and say, help. And they're like, what took you so long? <laughs> and we were kind of shocked by the, that answer. They knew that they had real estate holdings where we eventually started up our first of three, no, three locations now. And they were behind it. For them, it's perfect business sense. Libraries create trip counts. Moms love to take the kids to libraries. Libraries just solve a lot of community problems. But bottom line, in the business real estate, the commercial real estate market, that's a tenant that generates trip counts. And that allows any real estate leasing agent to say, we have this many cars. We have this much foot traffic coming in every day. And every dollar, every foot you can bank on getting a, a few dollars from. And that's just math. That's how it works. Well, it wasn't too long before we outgrew our first location. And we had some of the most wonderful problems that you could ever imagine. We budgeted for four computers. And what we found was completely wrong. Our assumptions was that, well, libraries are dying. You know, the <coughs> internet's solving all the problems. That's kind of true. But libraries are thriving like never before. The internet does solve problems when you have it. What we found were stories coming from everywhere. And a brief one was someone who was motivated to be self-empowering but hit a brick wall that we could punch through for them. The story is pretty much this. Me and mom sold everything in Idaho. We moved here. We put everything on the deposit and the first month on the apartment. We have no money. I knocked on every neighbor's door. Nobody has internet because it's a section eight, it's a poor housing complex. So what I'm looking to do from you is figure out how many cans and bottles I need to pick up on the side of the road to get a library card so I can log in to the corporate website and apply for the job that I've already got. I've already hustled, I've worked, and I've gone up and down the strip mall, and I found the job, and they say, you must apply online. That's what corporate says. So to get the job, I need to get online. You have computers. What do we do next? The stock patent answer was, here's your library card. We don't charge for that. Here's a, here's a tip jar. You know, if you want to you make a donation, great. But we solved somebody's problem, and they got to work. We didn't realize that what is generally called the digital divide is an amazing chasm that is of profound importance to people accessing social services. And that's really the, um, the heartstrings that I'm going to pull here. Some of the problems, and this one's almost a little too graphic for the, uh, for the lunch table, but people stealing our toilet paper. I, I can't be more brutally honest than that. If they need it, I'll go out and fundraise. You know, if they're that bad off, 
but these are the problems that, that we're solving. We, the last kind of heart-tugging story that I, I'd like to share is that um, one of our employees came back to the board of directors and said, we had a homeless family show up. They just got evicted and they didn't really have a plan for the next steps. And they said, well, we pretty much just thought we'd come here because we don't know what we're going to do next and we figured that you're not going to kick us out. <laughs> this really was impactful because it helped me x-ray the needs of the Aloha community. On a different tangent, um, at first I was a little mortified by the term. Someone, a good friend of mine called me a political entrepreneur and I had to go on the internet and figure out what that was. The definition is that I just do things that are pleasing to the public and I honestly have to take credit for the fact that the Aloha Library was my idea and I pushed it forward and it's gotten to a really wonderful place. But I've also started the Aloha Historical Society so that these stories that I'm sharing with you can be documented and a nonprofit community can provide synergy and not just have one library, but a kind of an ecosystem of nonprofits that are acting as a surrogate for the city services that we don't have. But I don't want to talk too much at you. I want to make sure that I have an interactive time for you. And so I'd like to kind of wrap up what I'm talking about with um, uh, just the, the brief overview of how we've moved to where we're going to next. We started with about 1,200 square foot of space in what we took over was a Goodwill donation station. And it was in a little um, satellite part of the strip mall, the Bales Finley, uh, uh, Bales Thriftway Center there at uh, Oak Kinnaman and, uh, and Farmington. Again, we just really grew quickly and we went from four to six computers. We almost doubled our space to close to 2,000 square feet of space. Now we're transitioning to a 9,000 square foot facility. One of the recent successes that we've had is we just started a $350,000 capital campaign to pay for the build out. And we're about the halfway point. One of the successes we had last November is that we were the poster child and we basically flew our flag out in public and said, oh my gosh, this is a success story. But in order to pay for this in the long haul, we need to address an issue and that was the tax funding for the library system was antiquated and hadn't been updated in about a decade. In Washington County, we have the Washington County Cooperative Library Services tax base. It was at 17 cents per thousand of assessed value for property owners. We went out and we asked for a nickel more. And with that nickel more, we were able to get plugged into the library system. What that's allowed us to get is about 400,000 for the first year and about that amount guaranteed for five years. In essence, two million dollars. <coughs> I'd like to gloat for a second on the numbers and that we've gone from fundraising and we've been able to maintain 1.5 full-time equivalents. So basically one and a half staff members. We're now in a hiring process because the county tax money is coming in and this entity has created 10 full-time jobs in a community that really needs it. So this is the architectural renderings of what our new space is gonna look like. The tenant morning Tuesday vacated the space from uh, the Bills Finley uh, Mall and I guess moved up to Tana's Forum. And what I love is the people who have started with us have grown up with us. Kent Wu did our first layout as an architect student and we hired his firm to come back and give us the architectural renderings. So as opposed to developing a community, we're also developing professional skills and paying back into the community. The launch from 1,200 to 2,000 to 9,000 square foot space has really been amazing. And our numbers have climbed with checkouts. The community goodwill has been there from day one. And if, before I open it up to questions, I wanna just share a frightening story that hopefully will scare you in a good way. I, um, I'm a three-time loser running for political office because I usually get an issue and I want to solve it and I don't care about you know, coming out and blowing sunshine people's way. I want to solve that one issue. And that's not how politics works. But I get people a choice. <laughs> but you know, that's why I'm going to fail because ethics and honesty in politics is oil and water doesn't mix really well. So I was at a political event and somebody leaned into my ear and said, you can have all these books, but you have a two-hour window to get them. 
And it was a community center up in, uh, it was the Middleton Jewish Community Center. They had their annual book sale and they said, here's the deal, we need the ballroom. You can have all of our leftovers, all of our unsold books, but you need to get them out in two hours because we need that ballroom for a banquet. I said, okay, I'll figure it out. So I went up to Budget Rent Trucks, which is right by the Elks Lodge, which uh, I used to meet at for another organization, the Washington County Public Affairs Forum, but since they closed, a lot of people had to move, and I hear you guys had to as well. Sorry for that. It wasn't my fault. So I went up to the, the Budget Trucks, uh, got a truck, and I'd never driven a 24-foot box truck before. There I am with 6,000 books, poorly stacked, driving down Beaverton Hillsdale Highway, and I can hear them falling over <laughs> in the back of the truck, and it took us two hours to load, 45 minutes to unload, and that became the seed capital that we used to get the library started. It was wonderful, and from the get-go, the community has provided, because it realizes that there are these safe harbors like the Aloha Library, all libraries that provide for the community and have wonderful programs. Uh, a quick pitch on one, reading to the dogs. Children who have problems with articulating um, and reading, who are fundamentally transitioning out of coloring books and looking to get into more of a, a school level reading, um, have a nurturing program we provide called Reading to the Dogs, where they get to pretend to read to a non-judgmental entity. And these dogs just sit and get petted and get read to, and it's a training program that helps develop the reading skills, especially for people who may have very fragile initial reading skills. And it's just been this home run success that we offer. And I think it really speaks to the sensibilities of what libraries do. So I'm, I'm dying to answer your questions, and I'm wondering who's got one for me. Let me get a Where's the new 9,000 square foot facility going to be? Well, that's a long story I've got to make short. <laughs> it's right next to the Peppermill Bar Lounge. And so it's very convenient for Al. <laughs> so uh, we are arguably in the same building. We're moving right around the corner. So the Bales Thriftway on Farmington Road. Yeah, I know what you're saying. So we sold the tickets for the Mustang for uh, Qantas there. OK. Also, uh, tickets at the store for people raising funds. So, OK, so you're in the same complex. Right, and arguably just right around the corner. Oh, okay. Behind the scenes, the we could actually, I think, punch through some sheetrock and walk between the two undercover. But we're going to be just moving around the corner. So all three locations have been in the same strip mall. These second two locations are in the same building, just right around the corner, about 100 feet apart. Okay. The reason I want to get quite clear is that uh, you folks have been very receptive for the gift of books, and I have taken books there. And they, for those that have, uh, want to clean off their shelf, they do give a 501c3 receipt. So it's good for a deduction if you need a deduction. That's been a, a, an amazing, successful program. We have a, a, a wonderful board member named Ellen. She runs an Amazon bookstore. At the risk of tipping our business model, if it prices out at $7 or more, it's worth us uh, for us to sell it on Amazon. If it's less than $7 in a retail value on Amazon, we put it for sale in our usually quarterly book sales. And what we've been able to do is run a library without government support, without government support, with book sales and private fundraising, employing people. What that told us is that we had a business model that was rigid, and solid, yet flexible enough to go out for the levy. And we had the broad-based community support, which we were concerned about because Aloha is not known for its affluence. The Amazon bookstore has been um, money in the bank. It's consistent. And it, uh, it would be uh, our, any donations of books would be warmly welcome, whether it's uh, leftovers, um, or if you want, just want a clean house, we, we find good homes for your books. Even including old books? Surprisingly, yes. Here's where we've chosen to be non-judgmental about the books. <laughs> what people buy is still a mystery to me. And behind me is uh, Fred Meyer. And I worked for five years at the Fred Meyer Beaverton and three more at the uh, Tiger Fred Meyer. And what came through my cash register? never cease to surprise me what people buy. <laughs> so um, what we do is we load up uh, barcode scanners on smartphones. And we can look up the price. And um, one of the things early on I wanted to make sure is we didn't waste. No donation should be wasted. So there are some gifts that are really difficult to monetize, like old textbooks from the 1960s that may have a specific value to somebody. 
they don't translate well on Amazon. Um, they're worthless to Amazon. But pulp vendors will purchase pallets of obsolete books and recycle them. Sadly, our US Post Office got rid of a, a discount post shipping system. It was used by service clubs and nonprofits to ship anything in English, like Africa, so they could learn English. And so those old textbooks actually had value because anything in English would be of a benefit. But with that going away, the pulp is the next best utilization we can. And so, you know, if it's a, a cookbook about kale or something, you know, a bad, a bad vegetarian cookbook, I'm a vegetarian. Uh, I might read it, but uh, maybe there, there's some stuff that's just got to be recycled. Um, but if we can find value in it, I think we've proven to be a frugal recycler because it's, we have people with puppy dog eyes looking for the next paycheck. And as a board, we've had to step up and, and manage that. So who's got my next question? Yes, sir. Have you had, uh, uh, where are you at on your fundraising? Uh, we are about halfway, so I think we've just crossed uh, about 175, 200,000, um, and some of that has been um, county um, funds. I, I, again, risking being political, Aloha has paid for library services that we've not had in our own community. We haven't had a mayor go down to the, the county and say, "This is our money, spend it here." Uh, almost. We've, uh, we're in the last throes of the permitting process. Forgive me, I, I skipped the last board meeting for other commitments, and after seven years of board meetings, I thought I was entitled to. <laughs> um, uh, so I, I think we're clear in the permitting process, and we're going through the last bits of negotiations with the contractor. One of the things we've got to do for the permitting, uh, well, to do it right, is um, we share a wall with a bar. And especially as the bar starts to ramp up at night, um, we need soundproofing. So that's been kind of a component. Since we're getting a better deal than retail on the rent, it's it's a good it's it's essential. So we're negotiating those details, but uh, we expect I can't promise that we're going to be open October first, um, but I'd say September first, November first is a 60-day window that we're hoping to have the construction completed and then open fully as a Washington County Cooperative Library Services full member. Short form, what that means is we're able to participate in reciprocity. What the Cedar Mill Library has is the ability for you to order up anything out of its 1.5 million member collective catalog. So countywide, you can order up a book from that library, have it dropped off at your home library, and drop off any book, any cooperative member, and it gets sent back home. When we open, we will have that option for our members because we'll be a full participating member. And that's really the excitement that we were able to offer that following the successful passing of the bond measure because the people of Aloha paid for that in the property taxes for decades. And then they had to go to Hillsborough or Beaverton or another library to get what they paid for. So for me, the Aloha Library resolves a dramatic, chronic injustice, not only for taxes, but for urban services and for people who just want to read. So um, there you have it. Next question. I'm, I'm going to go there and then, then there. Yes, sir. How are you direct as chosen? Uh, usually by fish hook. We uh, catch them and reel them in. So uh, through an application process. And we're always looking for good directors. Um, but we've been selective and we've been also blessed with some really incredible ones. Uh, we've had a fair amount of attorneys come through. Um, we've uh, uh, also had uh, county staff, amazing volunteers, professionals such as CPAs and uh, 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 through an application process is uh, how we typically get them. Sometimes they also percolate up through our volunteer base. Uh, but uh, that's really one of the things that I would encourage you as a club to suggest um, as you uh, maybe as you qualify people who are applying for grants and, and scholarships and help from your organization is to ask, have you served your community on, as a board on, um, on a nonprofit? 
uh, I feel that that's been one of the ways that uh, I've personally grown because I've had to jump in and solve problems. So uh, board service um, is one of the things I'm working on on a personal political agenda because a lot of nonprofit boards spend outrageous amounts of sums on insurance. And then as someone who held an insurance license for 27 <coughs> miserable months, I saw the claims come through. And people pay for it, and they, uh, there's a lot of loopholes and reasons um, people don't get covered. So um, I don't want to go off on that tangent too much further, but board service is uh, really mission critical because we wouldn't be where we're at without phenomenal people. So um, we'd be looking as is probably any other good nonprofit. You, sir, next question. Hey, uh, we've been long time supporters of the State of Mail Library, and we uh, periodically have had Peter Leonard uh, come and speak to us, and we did a couple months ago. A little bit surprised to learn that among the things that they found popular now are board games. Uh, <coughs> they were asking for them because they get a demand for them. Will you folks be doing anything in that area? Yes. First, a big thank you to Peter Leonard. When we went through the process of applying to become a member library, what happened was this. Nobody had applied for quite some time, so they moved the goalpost on us. They had about 17, 18 different criteria. They str streamlined it down to a, a couple. One of the big ones that lingered was checkouts. So you had to reach a benchmark uh, number of checkouts as a private library before you could apply. We met that. But that number got moved on us. We were, <laughs> so we worked. But the Cedar Mill Public Library was assigned to be our mentor library. Some libraries do it correctly. They do. Other libraries don't do it quite with the style that they do. To your point about alternate checkout items, what is really common when people say the word library is books. One of our number one checkouts was a DVD. And particularly in the Aloha community, we found that there's a lot of working poor. And the, what a lot of us may take for granted, if you buy DVDs at the Redbox or go to Blockbuster or get your DVDs and pay for them, is that um, you've got the money to do that. Our clientele often doesn't. And DVDs were a surprise to me personally to see as a, a checkout item that really uh, uh, jumped out on our numbers because when we're trying to meet that goalpost number that they moved on us, not like I'm grumpy about it at all, <laughs> is that uh, um, we realized that there were alternate items that needed to be checked out. A big thing about joining the cooperative is access to ebooks because those are purchased just like physical books are. And one of the success stories about the Aloha Library is that we often didn't spend, one of the areas we were able to contract on our budget was purchasing new books because the donations came in. How am I doing on time? You, about uh, five more minutes. Five more minutes? Okay. Just hit me with the bell. Okay. Back of the head. I can do that. Okay, excellent. <laughs> um, so other libraries are doing other things that are very innovative, such as tool checkouts. And... Of all things, and please, this is not slavery, but some libraries let you check out human beings. <laughs> Honest to God, yeah, I saw a few eyes pop in there. So you get to check out a human being as you would purchase the time by the hour of a professional like an attorney, an accountant, um, and that uh, volunteers just say, I'm here to help. So to really stretch the answer to the question, to the farthest possible limits of good taste. Some libraries let you, and think about it, you're already doing that anyway. Libraries are volunteer driven. We may have paid staff, but we rely on our volunteers. So by setting foot in the door, you're kind of demanding the service of a volunteer anyway. But some innovative libraries have stretched that to where you basically get the entire attention of, of the human being. So what we found was really the surprise unmet need in Aloha was computer access. And it wasn't just for the needy. Maybe this is pandering to this demographic, but we had one patron who was a grandma. She said, you know, I'm done with my work life. I'm retired. I don't want anything else to feed in my life. I don't want to feed at time. I don't want to feed at 
costly anything, and I don't want a printer in my house. I have a computer, but once a year I have to do my taxes, and I have to print them out. And what I'd rather do is go down to the library and access your printer. And this was another unmet need in the community that we had never thought of. And everything I thought about starting a library was completely wrong. I am here <laughs> hanging my head in shame. I was wrong, I was wrong, I was wrong. Absolutely wrong. And I never thought I'd hear this. Well, I'm a widow, I'm a grandma, and I want to spend time with kids. I spent my life in front of a computer screen. I don't want to feed a nasty ink machine that I've got to use once a year and the cartridges dry out. I'd gladly go down to the library and pay a dime to just use your printer because it's one less piece of clutter in my life. And I, I have a social outing and I'm with people that think like me and I'm in a library and it makes sense. And these are just the pipeline of stories that I sit at our board meetings and I either hear directly at a board meeting or as a volunteer that just <coughs> is part of the ecosystem that formed. And maybe that's kind of a, a good, <laughs> bewildering thing to wind down on, um, is that I was really amazed by, by what happened as we put up the sign that said library. What happened was literally, I, I'm convinced that anywhere in North America, you can put the sign up library in any sort of real estate, an outhouse, a strip mall, whatever, <laughs> and you're going to have resumes of top talent slid underneath the door that says, I'm here to help. Call me. And you're going to have stacks of books that are going to be stacked up against the door that says, I want other people to read this fantastic story. And you're going to have people knocking on the door that says, I'm here to help, and I'm not going to go away until I get a chance to help. Culturally, North America has been completely indoctrinated with the concept that libraries are for mutual benefit, they're for good. And if that would be the one single biggest learning experience that, I under, that I've received, the gift that I got, was absorbing that nugget of information. And I'm just so grateful you let me be here to share your stories. I'm gonna to try to remain, and if you have follow-up questions, I'd be delighted to have you bend my ear, um, because I got a gift. And what I got was this, uh, a gift. Uh, sir, would you remind me of your name? Pardon me. Your name? Sam Smith. Sam gifted me with a really wonderful story as I came in. Now, I, I kind of figured there was some sort of relationship between the Cedar Mill Kiwanis Club and the uh, Mount Hood Kiwanis Camp. Um, Sam told me about his fundraising efforts and his, um, uh, his storied past in creating that wonderful camp that serves so many, including <coughs> me. And so I just want to remind you that I got a chance to pay this forward. And I got <coughs> such a gift from you, Sam. Thank you, because that story took me back 32 years, and I'm just so grateful for that. If there's, there's a, a wonderful reason to be here, I think that was that. And I'm, uh, I just want to say thank you. Thanks for having me. I, I look forward to seeing you out in the community in the future. <laughs> Excellent. Fantastic. Thank you. I'm going to step over this. Perfect. Thank you very much, Eric. That was great. And I